and as we get going today, I, I want to kind of start off here, if I can. Uh, how many of us remember Hurricane Irma? Anybody here for Hurricane Irma last year? I don't know about you, but every time like, I hear about a hurricane coming towards us, I immediately go back to my last experience with a hurricane. And I'm from Orlando, so I've grown up with Hurricane Charlie. I mean, we went through some pretty big hurricanes, you know, about 15 years or, or so ago, 12 years or so ago. And, and I know every time a hurricane comes, there's kind of this energy that's around it. And it's really, really fun seeing people that are not from Orlando freak out about hurricanes and then look at the people who are from Orlando being like, I don't need anything, I'm fine, right? It's just such an interesting, an interesting thing. But last year, I was really nervous about this hurricane because I've got four kids and it was kind of chaotic thinking about how are we gonna sustain life for these four children in the event that we lose power. And we don't live in North Lake Park, we're not on the airport grid, so we don't have that lucky you know, situation. No, you North Lake Park people who don't ever, like you're watching the news, you're like, oh, I feel so bad for my neighbor that's two minutes away while I enjoy my air conditioning. I know how it goes. Uh, so, so as I'm in that situation, I, I begin preparing in a way I've never prepared before for a hurricane. So I'm up early, I'm getting plywood, didn't use it, still in my garage. I, I got that. Um, I, went to the home, I went to Home Depot and I grabbed the generator, got that thing prepped and ready. And, and I knew that I couldn't power everything, right? But I had to power a couple of things. Keep our fridge alive so there was food uh, and sustenance for our home. Maybe run a fan because at that point, you know, we had uh, a newborn in our house. And we were just kind of stressing around that, that reality. And so I got the generator set up, ran all of the wires after the hurricane hit, got prepared, got ready to turn the thing on. And I forgot the one thing you need to run a generator, which is... Gas, exactly. So I've got this beautiful generator. All of the wires lined up, ready to go, but I forgot to fill this thing up. And as a result of that, I had a beautiful generator that I could not use and a bunch of food that went bad. And unlike you people, we were suffering for Jesus seven days without power. And the worst part is of the whole thing is that they turned the power on at one point and we had it for like three hours around day four and then we lost it for an additional three hours. And we called in asking why is that the case? They're like, oh, we were just testing lines. Don't do that to me. Like, that's terrible. <laughs> but let me ask you this question. Have you ever felt like in life that, that, that there isn't enough in you to run all of the things that are connected to you? Let me say that again. Have you ever felt in life that there isn't enough in you to run all of the things that are connected to you? Maybe it's the work relationships that you've got to manage or the fact that you're raising kids or you're, you're just trying to figure out roommate situations and, and figure that process out or you're looking at the, the future that you're wanting to have. And there seems like there are so many demands on our time, so many demands on our emotional energy. Have you ever just felt like, man, I've got a lot of things connected to me, but there is not enough power in me to be able to run the things that are dependent on me. That's what we're going to talk about today. And what I love about Paul is that Paul in Romans chapter 8, this, this chapter that we'll be reading over the next couple of weeks, Paul is an incredible writer. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, I really encourage you to lean in a little bit and listen to the words of Paul over the next couple of weeks. Because Paul uh, is a lot like me, a lot like you, and that Paul didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus like, like Peter, James, and John did. He didn't get to walk with them. He wasn't an eyewitness to everything. But he did know the eyewitnesses like Peter, James, and John. And, and Paul knew those guys personally were able to pull on what they had experienced with Jesus, but that he also chose to walk away from financial wealth and from relational connection, becoming a follower of Jesus. What was so interesting to me about Paul is that Paul was one of the highest educated men of his day. He knew the Jewish Bible, the, what we call the Old Testament, that second, kind of first part of our Bible is put together. He knew that better than anybody else, trained under Gamaliel. And he, as a Jewish man who was also a Roman citizen, had a lot to lose by choosing to follow Jesus. And yet he did because of an encounter with him that changed his life. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're surrounded by people who walked away from a lot to follow Jesus because he changes our life. And last but not least, Paul, he waged war against Christians initially. This guy wasn't always team Jesus and on that side. He was working really hard actually to snuff out this movement, this little thing called the way because he thought it was bad for Jewish culture and for the standard in his region. But when he met Jesus, everything changed. And Paul, this really educated man, Paul, this guy who knows the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, better than pretty much any scholar during that day. Paul writes over half of the New Testament, and he provides incredible insights in how to understand the first half of this thing we call the Bible in his explanations of what it means to be a follower of Jesus in Romans 8. 
And what we find in Romans 8, this, this chapter that we call a chapter, really he just wrote a letter. What we find in Romans 8 is Paul reiterating over and over and over again certain declarations about who God says we are as followers of him. And like we talked about last week, it is of utmost importance that we understand what God thinks about us. Because more important than how I feel in a moment is what God declares things to be. Because if God says it, it means that it is. And so I want us over the next couple of weeks, whether or not we're struggling uh, in a certain part of our life, or whether or not we're wondering what God actually thinks about us, whether or not we're just struggling with the faith of our past and the church baggage of our background, trying to reconcile this childhood faith with an adult one, I want to just provide for us over the next couple of weeks a clear explanation of what God thinks about you. Because what God thinks about you is probably the most important thing about you. And so last week we talked about the fact that God declares us to be free, that I am free and you are free. We're free from the power of sin and its capacity to control us, and we're also free from the condemnation that follows. Today what I want to talk about is the fact that you and I were empowered, that, that God is going to tell us that, that in, in a way that is different than probably any other way we could imagine, God is empowering us and giving us the energy we actually need to run all of the things that are connected to our life. And we'll start in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, when, when Paul says this. He's reflecting on what he's written before, and he says this. You are not controlled by your sinful nature. Now, pause there. Let's talk a little bit about sin. We talked about sin last week. That sin is this, not just the bad things that we do, right? That's kind of the way that we think about it. But sin is actually a disease that's in us. It is a universal experience that all of us have. That Because of the, the brokenness of humanity, we're all infected by sin and we're all affected by it. So you might know that um, I'm up here teaching right now um, with a stomach bug, right? That my, my wonderful wife decided to broadcast that on Facebook. And so um, our family has been going through stuff, all right? I mean, Wednesday night, um, Ollie comes down with it. Thursday, Jackson gets it. Friday, Stacy gets it. Saturday, yesterday, Emma gets it. And I'm just walking through my house, right? Like, you know how stomach bugs go, right? If you, when a kid brings something home, it's like it just ravages everyone, right? And I'm just walking through my house, right? Changing diapers, hugging kids, you know, t you know, patting backs, just the whole time thinking, I'm going to get this. Like, there's no way around it. But here's the stressful moment, right? Here's the thing when you've got like this infection kind of rolling around your house, right? You know you're going to get it. You just don't know when you're going to get it, right? So I had this moment, right? I started researching incubation periods and all this type of stuff. And I realized, I realized like most likely sometime between like Thursday and Friday, I've probably caught the bug. And I'm walking around all day on Friday, all day on Saturday, realizing I'm infected with the disease. My house is affected by it, but I know I'm infected by it. I just don't know when it's going to happen, if you get what I'm saying. And that, that's a little bit fearful, right? Because it's like every time you eat something, you're like, oh, gosh, is this, is this the moment? Like, you, you never know. So last night at 4 a.m., so five and a half hours ago, I wake up out of a deep sleep and realize the infection has arrived and it's time. Sin is a lot like that. And I think God gave me this as an illustration for your benefit. Here we go. <laughs> We're all infected by sin. And the symptoms of how that sin is going to, you know, become apparent, if you will, in our life is different. And we don't always get to determine when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen, but the inevitability is that it is going to happen. And our sin, that infection that we've got, it affects everyone around us. Sin is this contagious thing that, that is universal to the human experience. And Paul says, and he, he tells us this last week, right? You're free from the control and the power of sin. You're free from the condemnation that comes with it. And then he says in verse 9 this, you're not controlled by it anymore. Instead, he introduces something else. He says that we're not controlled by our sin anymore if we're followers of Jesus. But he says you are controlled, and, and underline these two words in your Bible, the Spirit of God living in you. And remember, those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. So he's making a switch here. He's saying, listen, you're no longer controlled by your sinful nature. You are now controlled by the Spirit of God, which begs this massive question that I want to spend some time on today. Who is the Spirit? Because I don't know if you're anything like me, if you have any kind of church background growing up, you hear that phrase, the Spirit, and maybe you get a little bit nervous, right? 
Because the spirit when I grew up as a little kid meant like these like, you know, these moments where like we sang songs for seven and a half hours, right? And, the, and the, that was the spirit. And, and while God's presence is definitely inhabits the praises of his people, I, I never understood the idea of the spirit. I thought the spirit was just like a power or like a force or like an energy, right? Like, you know, think about like a cartoon where like something shoots out of like a superhero's hand. Like that's the spirit. Like that's what I thought. So I want to give you a definition for the spirit, and it's long, and it's clunky, and I did my best, but remember, I was taking care of a lot of sick kids. So write this down, all right? The spirit, so whether or not that's in your Bibles, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, etc. whenever you see that word, the spirit, the spirit is God. This is massive, okay? It means that when you hear the word spirit, don't think of just a power or an energy or a life force, right? Like, that's not what we're talking about. We're actually talking about the person of God. It is the name authors in the Bible use to describe God as he invisibly interacts and engages with creation and humanity. That's what the Spirit is. The Spirit is actually God invisibly interacting and engaging with all of humanity. Now, now here's the reality. The Spirit is a power and is powerful. There is no doubt about that. But that powerfulness comes out of the personhood of being God. So I want to give you a, just kind of quick kind of study, if you can, if I can. It's going to be very, very high level, like just kind of broad, if I can, of the, the storyline of the Spirit. Because I want you to see that there's a transition and a shift that happens from the beginning of the book in Genesis to the end of it that is important for us as people. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, we find this, that the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Here's why this is so important for us to understand. Uh, regardless of how you read the Genesis account, I know there's a variety of perspectives on this. We believe that the Genesis account is the storyline of how God spoke and created and developed the, the situations and environments in which the world would be made. And what we find here from the beginning is that the Spirit of God is the de- creative, powerful person that takes what is not existing and creates something out of it. Now, if you go throughout the rest of the Old Testament, what you'll find is that the Spirit of God is this powerful creating source. It's a fuel. It is the person that fuels and energizes and empowers all of creation. The prophets, the people who are in the later part of the Old Testament, who are all pointing to and and hoping for this coming king that's going to reconcile broken humanity back to itself, all talk about a spirit that's going to come. And then there are these two incredible stories in, in the narrative of Jesus that that I think capture this so well. And anytime you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you find a story that's in all four of what we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, pay really specific attention to that. Because what it means is that it is an incredibly important part of the storyline of Jesus, that all of the writers would include it. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all include the story that I'm about to read to you. And I'm going to read it out of Luke chapter 3 because what I love about Luke is Luke was a medical doctor who interviewed countless hundreds of eyewitnesses who spent time around Jesus. He interviewed first person eyewitnesses and he collected all of this information to put together what he calls an orderly account of the life and times of Jesus. Now this is what we find in Luke 31, 3 verse 21 and 22. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Here's why this is massive, okay? Jesus lives on the earth for 30 years. And then he goes to the the river to get baptized. And as he comes out of the river, that's when he begins his public ministry. That's when he begins healing people. That's when he begins speaking in public environments. That's when he begins kind of continuing on and really launching the journey that he's going to be on to redeem and, and do what none of us can do for ourselves, purchase our right standing before God. But I want you to pay attention to this because it's massive. Is that the same Holy Spirit that, that was the one that gave the power to actually create something out of nothing is the same Spirit that comes upon Jesus and empowers him to do his earthly ministry, and all of the supernatural things that would occur as a result. The the Holy Spirit is the fuel that generates all of the movement that is necessary. But even beyond that, Jesus just doesn't stop there. 
Because at the end of the story, after Jesus has done all these incredible miracles, after he's defeated death on our behalf, raised himself from the dead, he comes, we come to John chapter 20, verse 21 and 22, and, and Jesus, looking at his disciples, this ragtag group of guys who are cowards, who ran away from him at his, at his um, crucifixion, who denied him like Peter, pretended like he didn't exist, went back to their old jobs, because like, this is an important point to remember, there was no Christianity at the cross. When Jesus died and was crucified, no one believed that Jesus was who he says he was. They just thought he was a good guy, a good friend, but he died like everybody else. But then three days later, he rose, and those same people who did not believe that Jesus was who he says he was began to believe, not because they had a bunch of good teachings to hold on to, but because they saw a resurrected Jesus. If you had a friend who you buried, and then three days later, you were hanging out, having a fish fry with him, would you not lean in a little bit to what he's saying? And it's in those moments that Jesus, interacting with his disciples, would say this. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the Father has sent me. I also send, so they're now about to begin their ministry. I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed. That word breathe is the word ruach, the idea of breath being connected to this whole idea of the power and the presence of God. And said to them, receive what? The Holy Spirit. The personal presence and power of God. So I want you to catch this, because the storyline of the Bible is this, is that the power of God, the Holy Spirit, is what speaks and creates, and then empowers Jesus' ministry, and then empowers the first followers of Jesus' ministry, and then in Acts, what we'll find is that very Spirit is what empowers every single one of our lives, if we're followers of Jesus. That the Holy Spirit is not this faraway, esoteric force that, you know, we kind of try to tap into sometimes. It's not just that. It's the very person of God with us and in us, empowering us for the work that God has called us to do. But here's the thing. That's kind of confusing, isn't it? Like, as clear as that might be, that sometimes it's hard to kind of understand this idea that God is in me. And so I want to unpack that for you by helping you understand something about the nature of humanity. And this is what Christians believe. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, you don't have to believe this, but I think it's good for you to understand what it is that we, we actually believe about how humanity works. And here's how it works for us. We believe that we're a soul with a body. We are a soul with a body. Now, this is very important, okay? We are not bodies that have a soul. We are souls with a body. What that means is that this body, this thing right here, it's not going to last forever, but my soul does. That my very essence, my very identity, who I am, that part of me lasts for all of time. But the reality is that what we talked about, our soul and our body is infected by sin. And so our sinful nature, that word that we've used, right, as we've been looking at Romans 8, that sinful nature, it infects every nook, cranny, and crevice of our soul. It corrupts what was meant to be good and pleasing, and enjoyable, and kind. And let's be honest, you don't have to, I don't have to convince you that our souls are infected by sin if you have kids, right? Like, no one needs to be convinced of that, right? Like, they just come out selfish, and needy, and angry, right? And they just hit each other. Like, like today, I'm walking out of the, you know, out past my foyer, heading towards the car, and Jackson, my two-year-old, who's kind most of the time, looks at Ollie, who's playing with a toy, walks over to him, pushes him with two hands, drops him on the ground. My one-year-old, who can barely walk, picks up the Legos and walks the other way, right? No one taught him that. It's just that he's affected by sin. The beauty of, of the good news, what we call the gospel, right, is that God comes and he makes a way for our soul to be made right. Romans 7, 24 says this, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul basically saying, listen, I know that my body's corrupted, I know that my soul's corrupted, and I cannot deliver myself from this. I don't even know how to do it. I don't have the map or the plans. But then we see this beautiful picture in the good news, that God's spirit starts curing our soul. That the moment we put our trust and our faith in Jesus, if you remember the illustration last week, the moment we move from being in Adam to in Jesus, the Holy Spirit, permeates our soul and begins the process of curing that which is corrupted. And this is why Christians sometimes get the tag of being hypocritical. Have you ever heard that before? Right? Like if you're a Christian, you're hypocritical. And if somebody ever says that to you and you think, I'm not hypocritical, you are. And it's okay. Because here's the deal. While the Holy Spirit has entered our soul, we're still having our bodies, our flesh. 
And these two things are at war with one another. Paul explains it this way in Galatians 5.17. He says, for the desires of the flesh, think about your body, okay? For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. That's what's in your soul, God's presence in your soul. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. So we agree, right? The spirit of God, God wants to do what God wants to do. Would we agree with that? And every time God wants to do something, it's the right thing, right? Because he's God, right? Even if I don't like it, God gets to make the call, right? He wrote the game. He wrote the rules. He always wins, right? That, that's the way that it works. But my flesh doesn't like God. We talked about that last week. My body naturally desires to do what I want to do. So here's what happens. I want to do what I want to do. And God wants to do what he wants to do in my soul. And that creates a little battle, doesn't it? So verse 17 says, these things are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now the reason why we're hypocritical, <laughs> the reason why, as Paul says in Romans 7, I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I want to do and, and I'm just a mess and who's going to deliver me from this body? And the reason why we do that is because our bodies were corrupted from the moment we were born and so were our souls and God is doing an inside job in us. And while our soul is becoming clean and being purified, that doesn't mean, not mean that our broken bodies are going to. But here's the beauty. Is that one day, either when Jesus returns or when we pass away, there's a promise that's given to us in the scripture that our souls will one day receive new sinless bodies. And in those new sinless bodies, a old but now purified sinless soul will inhabit it. And this new body, I love how 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 5 says it. It says, for we know that when this earthly tent, that's what he's describing as our body, we live in is taken down, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. How cool is that that God is fashioning a body just for you? Anybody, right? Like, I've been praying, right, because he hears prayers. I'm like, God, give me the, the build of Michael Phelps, all right? And my same face because I love it. Like, that, that's what I'm telling him, right? <laughs> we grow weary in our present bodies. Anybody grow weary? You ever feel like the things that are connected to your life are just too much to deal with? Your emotional energy is shot. Your physical energy is gone. Yeah, Paul explains that. He says, we grow weary in our present bodies. And we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. When? This is what he says. God himself has prepared us for this. And as a, what would you say? Worthy on the count of three. One, two, three. Guarantee he has given us his Holy Spirit. So the way that you know that you're getting a new body, <laughs> the way that you know that, that one day all of this broken, weary, tired, corrupted, exhausted body and experience that you have, the way that you know that it's going to get better is because the Holy Spirit has been put a down payment on your soul. And when the Holy Spirit inhabits something, there is nothing that can kick it out. So here's the summary of verses 9 to 11. I think some of the most complicated verses in all of the Bible. That when our life is placed in Jesus, his presence inhabits our soul and empowers us for life with him now and forever. And that soul is dead until God regenerates it. So I had a generator at my house connected to all of these things. How effective was the generator that I had? It wasn't effective, right? It was just a waste of 300 bucks, right? That's what it was at that point. I had all of the things connected to it, and the generator was there, but the generator, hear me, was dead. It was dead because it didn't have the fuel it needed in order to live. And when the Holy Spirit enters your soul, it regenerates this broken soul and allows it to function the way that it was supposed to be. But the problem is, right, is that, you know, you can't only put certain kinds of fuel in a generator if you want it to work. And the problem with so many of us is that we know this in some ways, our heart knows it, but we end up killing our souls when we fill it with cheap fuel. And for some of us, the cheap fuel is materialism. It's just this pursuit of the next thing that we think is going to make us happy. And retail therapy makes us spend a lot of money, but it doesn't make us happier in the long run. It's for a moment, but maybe not forever. For some of us, it's the achievement of our kids. I mean, we spent so much time and so much energy investing as much as we can into them. And if we're honest, it's not just about them. It's because we want to feel like we're doing a great job. And sometimes we can be selfish parents. And in the moment, yeah, they win the award, but did they lose their soul in the process? For others of us, it's the cheap relationships. So we just swipe left or right or whichever way it is. I'm not sure which one it is, but we swipe on, on the dating app, right, for a quick, casual hookup because we're looking for something to fuel our soul. And, and for a moment, maybe there's a spark, but it isn't long-lasting. 
And God's invitation to me and God's invitation to you is say, listen, there is actually something that fuels your soul completely. In fact, you were designed to only be able to generate the power you need to run all the things that are connected to your life on God's spirit alone. That's what you need. You need God's presence and power tangibly in your soul if you're going to run the life that God has designed for you to run. So but let me ask this question then. If I'm empowered by God's spirit, let, let, let's say that, that I've put my faith and my trust in Jesus and my soul is being cured and being filled and being fueled and being empowered by God's spirit. What am I empowered to do? That's what we find in verses 12 and 13. I want to give you two things. The first one is this. God's spirit empowers us to live forever. You know what I love about the environment that we're in is that everybody wants to live forever. You know, there's like songs about this, right? Forever young, I want to be forever young, right? That's why we spend so much money trying to make ourselves look younger than we actually are, right? Like that, that, that's why there's a whole industry around that. We try to cheat time as much as possible. It's why you eat so much kale even though it's disgusting, right? Notice how I said you eat kale because I'm not about that life, right? But there's the deal. We do all of that to try to prolong our life. And, and God would say, listen, 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 listen. I've empowered you to live forever already. Look, look at this in verse 11. He says, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. So notice this. Jesus came back to life. Breath came back in his lungs because the spirit of God was there. Lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give you life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living in you. That the promise that's given to all of us, the deposit that's already been made on our life is that if I put my faith and my trust in Jesus, then his spirit is in me. And no matter what happens to my mortal body, my eternal soul will forever be with him. And I'm going to get a new one. And that's good news for us who, who get that diagnosis and don't know how to deal with it. It's good news for us as we look at people who we love, who, who, who we've lost, maybe too early or maybe not when we wanted to, and to know, okay, if the Spirit of God is in them, it means that they're going to have life forever. It allows us to face this scary thing called death and realize that death is not the end of the story. I want you to write this down or at least consider it because I think if you reflect on this, it'll help you in every area of life. It is God's character and nature to bring life to everything he is invited to inhabit. That wherever God goes, life goes as well. So maybe your marriage is on the rocks right now. I would invite you to bring God and invite God to inhabit that marriage because he brings life to things that are broken. Maybe it's your relationship with your kids right now and that feels dead. Would you invite God to inhabit it because wherever God is invited, he brings life as well. That's why in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, and 57, these are Paul's words again. He'll say this, oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. You are empowered to live forever. You have been given victory. And just so you know, that's the greatest news of all time. This is not the only life that we have. We are eternal souls that will have eternal bodies, and we have been given a way to live forever by our Heavenly Father. Here's the second thing. We're empowered to choose better. Verse 12 and 13 say this, therefore, brothers and sisters, you have no obligation. Anybody like to be obligated to do things? Not a fan, right? I hate it. I want to do it because I want to do it, not because somebody says I have to. You have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. So here's what Paul's saying. Listen, when you're empowered by the Holy Spirit, when you give your life to Jesus, you get to choose better. See, when you're not in Christ, when you're not following Jesus, it's an inevitability that you're going to do dumb, right? Is that not the case? It's like you want to do right and you're still going to do wrong. It's why you're in the seventh relationship with the same terrible type of guy because you can't walk away from the train wreck. And God would say, listen, you don't have to choose that. You are a slave to that when you don't have me. But when you're with me, you don't have to choose it. You can choose better. You can choose to look at the sin or the addiction that's been bothering you your whole life and say, you know what? I don't have to do that today. Because I am who you say I am. I don't have to step into that. You can look at the situation where people are asking to, you know, compromise your values and say, I don't have to do that. 
I'm not obligated to my boss to do stuff that, that isn't ethical. I'm not obligated to the environment of the culture I'm in to do stuff that everybody else says, okay, I'm not obligated to do anything I don't want to do because I'm free from all of it. But begs this question, right, especially if you're a follower of Jesus. Yeah, but what about when it feels like all I do is fall? You see everybody there? It's like I'm talking about that, right, the sin that you have no obligation to and the thing that you struggle with the most is probably what came up as I've been talking about, right? Yeah, 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 I get you, Colin, but like I've tried this Jesus thing and, and, and it doesn't seem like I'm over it yet. Like shouldn't I be past it already? I want to show you a video real quick and then I want to explain it. Let's go ahead and play it. Here he goes. Here he goes. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. It's my one-year-old who just started walking about six weeks ago. Now, here's the thing. My one-year-old's walking is, like, pretty terrible. Can we agree? <laughs> like, no one's thinking, oh, man, like, that's the next Usain Bolt. Like, no one's saying that right now, right? Here's the thing. I'm pretty convinced the reason why my kid can even walk at this point is not so much because he's figured out walking, but it's because his head is bigger than his body. And as his head flips forward, it just takes the momentum with him and his feet follow. Like, that's what I think it is. Now, here's the thing. I love watching my kids walk. It's one of the favorite kind of moments, right? And I'm so glad I got to be there and be present for some of his first steps. In my grandparents' house, it was just really cool. And so we'd stand him up, right? And he'd wobble his feet. He'd take a couple of steps, fall flat, right? Stand up, wobble, take a couple of steps, fall flat. Stand up, wobble a couple of steps, fall flat, right? That, that's how kids learn how to walk, right? Okay, how terrible a father would I be? If I looked at Ollie, my one-year-old, and said, hey, you're in Outer Bridge, and Outer Bridges walk straight, and they walk all the time. You're not my son until you figure out how to walk. How horrible would that be? Be terrible parenting, right? But my son doesn't hear that from me. I freak out. I take videos and show them to our church about my one-year-old taking four steps. Why? Because he's my son, and I'm proud of him, and I love him. And I'm not worried about him falling nearly as much as the fact that I get to be with him when he's walking. And that's how God feels about you. Your identity is not connected to how well you're walking in life, but who is walking with you. That's, that's the point and the good news of the gospel. That's why in Romans 8, 14, Paul would say this, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are the children. It means that if you've trusted Jesus with your soul, then he's made residence and inhabited it. And if he's inhabited it, it means that you get to walk with him. And so, yeah, you're going to fall. Yeah, you're going to make mistakes. Yeah, you're going to think you ever overcame that sin pattern or that struggle or that attitude, right? But guess what? Your body's still infected with it, and your body and your spirit are at war. And one day that war is going to be won by the spirit, and you're going to have a new body. It's going to be a good day. But in between, don't stress out because God is with you, and he's not looking at you saying the, you know, the reasons why or the things that you have to meet or the standards that are created for you to belong to me is that you've got to figure out how to walk perfectly. But say, no, 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 I'm going to walk with you. In fact, the reason why God allows us to fall is because God wants to reveal, us, reveal to us more about his character and nature. Look how John Piper puts it. He says, God plans that there be a long history of redemption and a long battle in every individual's life. Because in that battle, certain elements of his glory and his patience, how many of you have realized that God is real patient with you, <laughs> right? You're not going to know that if you're instantaneously perfect, right? Wisdom, love, his kindness, his patience and justice are displayed in ways that they would not be displayed if he redeemed things instantaneously. The reason why we fall, the reason why we mess up is because our soul is at war with our body. Yeah. And God says it's okay because every time you fall, you get back up. And when you get back up, you recognize that I'm the one that's holding you up anyway. So here's the question I want to leave us with today. Going back to that image, because we're either in one of two places. We're either right now people who have a soul, or we're people with, that have a body and have a soul. And our soul and body is infected by sin. Like if we're honest and we've acknowledged it, we have never trusted Jesus or asked God to be the one to save us. And the reality of that is that we are a corrupted soul with a corrupted body. And the inevitability of a corrupted soul and a corrupted body is that a corrupted soul cannot inhabit a perfect body that God has created for them. And then for others in the room, 
We know that God's spirit is curing our soul because we trusted him. And the reality is that as we've trusted him, life has been better and we're growing and we're taking better steps. And maybe we're not where we want to be yet, but we can see that we're definitely not who we were. And to those of us who resonate more with the image that's all black, corrupted soul, corrupted body, my invitation to you today is to know that you can trust Jesus. And that trusting Jesus with your soul, trusting Jesus with your identity, saying, God, I am who you say I am more than what I tried to be on my own is the greatest decision you could ever make. And I would invite you to do that by simply, in your own words, in just a moment, praying to God and saying, God, I trust you. Jesus, I need you. And I believe that you are the one that saves me. And for those of us that are followers of Jesus, those of us that have that, that spirit in us, I want you to, to do two things. One, I want you to rejoice in that fact that you get to live forever in a perfect body where there is no more pain and there is no more wrong and you get to be with God forever. Rejoice in that. Tell your face how good God has been. And the second thing is this, is receive the grace that God's given you. Like some of us are so stressed out and so bound to our own anger over what we haven't gotten figured out yet, why we aren't a better husband, why we aren't a better parent, why we aren't a better you know, follower of Jesus. And God would say, listen, I have a plan for you and I'm walking with you. Allow yourself to receive the grace I've already given. Don't go back to the prison I've already freed you from.